Really excited about this episode. We're going to be talking all about building strength. My guest, Matt Crow, has a vast amount of experience over many, many years helping people under all sorts of physical challenges to build strength. And why do we want to build strength? Because with inflammatory arthritis, it's all too easy to lose some muscle mass. And it's very, very common to want to put on some weight. Well, putting on some weight, putting on some muscle is what we're talking about today. You're going to learn why we really must build some strength. We're going to learn about muscle building fundamentals and what the body actually needs to be able to put some muscle on. Going to be talking about working out from home, some starting exercises and using some stuff around the house that's simple and available that can help you with your objectives. We're going to dismiss some myths. Uh, Is it easier for men or women? We're going to uh, dismiss or dispel some of these myths and talk about some workarounds if your joints hurt so that we can overcome um, those hurdles and still be able to build some strength. So that's what we're going to cover in this episode. Matt is also going to be joining us in rheumatoid support for the monthly live training webinars that I do. And if you like what you hear from Matt today, come join us in rheumatoid support. Just send me an email, info at pattersonprogram.com, and I will ask a few questions and find out if you're a good fit. And if I believe that I can help you over the next 12 months, come join us in rheumatoid support. Matt's going to be the special guest um, for this month and be able to go into specifics about how to build some exercise routines about uh, around problematic joints and build muscle and supporting muscle mass for those um, parts of your body. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Let's get stuck into it now. Here's myself and Matt Crow. Today, we've got a special guest who's actually a really good friend of mine from Australia. His name is Matt Crow. Um, he's got over 28 years experience in the fitness and wellness industry as a personal fitness coach a gym owner, presenter, researcher, and educator who specializes in helping men and women of all ages and fitness levels stay in peak physical and mental condition. He holds a degree in human movement and exercise physiology and is a former professional athlete and has conducted over 50,000 personal and group training sessions. And today, we're going to talk about building strength. G'day, Matt. G'day, Clayton. Thanks for having me on the show. And thanks for doing this nice, bright and early. I know it's 6 a.m. there in Sydney, and uh, I appreciate you making time for us. No, happy to do it. The sun's just coming up here as I speak, so uh, it's a nice time of day. Beautiful, mate. Now, you've been putting out a lot of content recently, and I've been watching what you've been putting out. Uh, And this is really what's caught my attention and said, I've got to get Matt on the podcast, even if he has to get up at 6 a.m. to do it, because... Um, you know, the content you're putting out is around strength. And during the past several months, as we're sort of still, we haven't really exited this sort of COVID period of the world, um, strength building just has has become a big challenge with no access to gyms and particularly people with inflammatory arthritis at home. It, it leaves them really exposed. So today I want to talk about strength building. And I'm going to throw to you the first question, why, why should we build strength? Well, uh, first of all, everybody um, should build strength, no matter whether they've got inflammation in their joints or whether they're just a normal person looking to improve their quality of life. But for anybody with rheumatoid arthritis or any inflammation, it becomes even more important. In fact, I would consider it the most important conditioning element you can do above all others. Um, And mainly because what we're going to do when we strengthen the muscles is we're going to support the weak and inflamed joints. And it's as simple as that. That's the number one reason. We build the muscle. I like to think of it like a small sapling, right? When you've got a small sapling, you plant it in the ground. It's not going to stay up by itself because it's weak and it's just growing. You've got to put stakes in. You've got to put strings around it to hold it up. That's what happens when you do strength training. You build muscles and they build the ligaments around that joint and support it to make it stable and strong. And what that effectively does is take the strain off the joint, right? If we can take the strain off the joint, we have less inflammation, we have less pain, we have greater range of motion. And, and aside from that, you know, strength training is going to do a lot more for you. Obviously, we're going to increase your bone density, which rheumatoid arthritis will affect, especially if you're taking any other drugs that they recommend. I mean, obviously, we're not condoning that wherever we can. 
Um, it's also going to help your posture. It's going to help your balance and your stability. It's going to help your body weight because uh, strength training is the number one way long term to look after your body weight. Now, if we can control your body weight, once again, we can control how uh, much stress is on the joint. So the more, the less the weight, the less stress on the joint. Once again, the less inflammation, the less um, pain you can experience. And so there are many things. And what you get most of all from the strength training is you just get this feeling of confidence and of wellness and of ability, you know. You're able to move, you're reaching your, you're able to work in your potential a little more. So strength training, Clint, I cannot recommend it enough. As you can see, I'm very passionate about making sure people uh, in uh, certain uh, demographics and especially the elderly are really concentrating on um, strength training first and foremost. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, everyone would be nodding along like I have been. That it's, It just makes sense, doesn't it? There's nothing in here that's even vaguely controversial. Uh, if, we, if I think of a couple of studies coming out of the medical published literature about specifically rheumatoid arthritis and exercise, um, whilst the actual references aren't in my mind, but I can post them on the, the notes for this show, um, one is uh, recommends cardiovascular activity just to reduce the risk factors of other diseases because with rheumatoid, you tend to be susceptible to getting other, uh, other diseases more so than other people, cardiovascular, diabetes, and so on. And then also the strength training that you've just talked about and how the clinical studies show a reduced amount of inflammation overall in the body by doing some resistance training within people's physical capabilities over a period of three months. And so, you know, the science supports it, common sense supports it. Um, and, and I love what you mentioned about the feeling of self-confidence or the self-esteem, because when we get too skinny, for example, because our bodies are struggling and, and it hurts to move the joints, you know, we lose self-esteem. But then if we can put some muscle on, gosh, especially especially uh, if we've lost a lot and we put some back on, it, it, it matters tremendously. So why don't we talk about how we can build some muscle then, some strength building fundamentals. But Clint, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that I think the biggest obstacle I, I get when I'm talking about strength training with um, inflammation-based uh, people is that they're scared it's going to hurt them more. All right? that's, that's something I really want to make sure I touch on. Um, and and every study after study shows quite conclusively that people with rheumatoid arthritis have substantial improvements in all their factors as far as reduced inflammation, reduced flare-ups, um, uh, reduced pain. And whilst you're doing it, obviously you have to be careful when you do it. And, you know, you're not going to do it during a severe flare-up, but there's still other things you can do. So and, and it becomes more important the older you get, right? Mm. And on top of that, sort of the range of motion is something I just I didn't mention before. Taking that joint through range of motion as, poss- as, as often as possible is really important because we're flushing out that joint, we're, we're lubricating that joint when we're taking our, you know, the joints through range of motion continually. And that just keeps them working in, in, in an optimal order. So anyway, yeah. so is how. Yeah, how are we going to do it? I mean, what's the because a lot of folks with RA so I'm struggling to put on weight. So the word weight comes up, and I respond, "Well, you know, you got a, got some fundamentals, and you're about to, you know, finesse my answer here. I'll just give you the broad response. They say you need to eat enough and eat enough energy each day so that you're able to have a surplus energy to provide some muscle growth. But you also need to work the muscles. You got to do something. So what what's what's the uh, What's the more complicated or full answer there? Well, and the underlying strength training, it's very simple. We've got to take the muscle past its comfort zone on a repeated basis so that the body on a physiological basis breaks down or has to respond. It has to adapt to get to be able to do that stimulus on a continual basis. It has to break down and rebuild and become stronger. So essentially strength training just makes muscles stronger. It makes them bigger and it makes them more endurance resistant and and that's what we really want from them and um so when it comes to strength training you know i i work on what's called a minimal effective dose theory um i've studied uh like i said exercise science for the last 30 years in the last 10 years it's it's great for everybody because the science is really showing that you have to do 
a lot less time, right, yeah, as far as your, your weight training or your, or your cardio training than you th- when we ever thought before because, uh, you know, the body is much more responsive and adaptive than we ever thought. So I work on this minimal effective dose. What does that mean? That simply means what is the minimal amount we have to do to elicit a good physiological or a positive physiological response. So my workouts that I work with um, rheumatoid arthritis clients, you know, they're, they're a jigsaw effect. So there's a series of these little workouts that take anywhere from 7 to 20 minutes. That's all. Right? And we piece them together to make sure we cover all the facets of, of the conditioning that we want to cover. So when we're talking about strength training in particular, right, um, I have some golden rules. And the golden rules that everybody should follow when they're doing strength training, there's four. So first of all, when you're doing strength training, number one, technique. Never compromise technique. So if you can get your technique right, you make sure you're working the right muscles, you're working safely, and you're working effectively, getting into that right muscle. Number one. Number two is range of motion. Very important when you're doing the strength training to go for as complete a range of motion through the exercise as you can. So we're not only going to ensure that we've got load through the full range of the joint and through the full range of the muscle, but as I said before, we're also going to flush that joint out with synovial fluid. We're going to keep lubricating it, and it's going to make it more mobile in the future. So first of all, technique. Second of all, range of motion. Third of all, it's speed of movement. So speed of movement is really critical and something which I focus more on than any other aspect of, the, of strength training with rheumatoid arthritis because your, your speed of movement dictates how many repetitions you can do. Repetitions, that's how many times you do the actual exercise and, and, and how much weight you can lift. So but the speed of movement is really key. And then the, the fourth rule is the weight that you add. Now, the weight, the rule with adding weight is that it can't compromise the first three rules. All right, so weight is only as good as the technique is perfect, the range of motion is full, and the speed is the speed that we've chosen. Right? If you get those four rules in place, right, then you can construct any program and, any, and do any exercise safely and effectively, and that's very important. So when it comes to, uh, you know, as far as, as choosing what to do, like I said, I have a number of different workouts. I work on all different aspects, um, but effectively I have three sort of speeds that I like to do the training at because weights in general, weight training in general, and people who suffer any type of disabilitating sort of um, injury or who are elderly or people with rheumatoid arthritis inflammation, um, the speed of movement is slow. I like it slow, Mm. right? there's, there's three three um, speeds that I choose for working with rheumatoid arthritis. First one's the standard, and basically what I'm going to explain to you, I won't get too technical for you, right? But imagine we are doing a squat, okay? We're doing a squat, and we're standing up straight. We're going to go, the standard one is four seconds to lower yourself down to the lowest point of the squat, pause for one second, and stand up relatively quickly for two seconds. That's what I call a standard pacing of weight training. What it means, it's nice and slow in what's called the eccentric phase. That's the downward phase. That's the most important one. Not the one where we push up the weight, but where we lower the weight down with gravity. Whether that's doing a bench press where you're pushing things out in front of you, whether you're doing pulling you know, on a lat pull down towards you, the, put, the downward phase is the most important. That's where we get the real strength and the real control, right? And it's really important that one second pause that happens at the change of direction. What that means, and especially for rheumatoid arthritis, is that we don't bounce the joint. You've seen people in the gym where they go really fast and they just bounce off their joints, right? right. People with inflammation in their joints, they cannot take that strain. That's only going to make it worse. And above all else, that pause has to be um, really emphasized. So we've got standard, four down, one pause, two up. Then we have probably the one I do most of all, which is very simple. Four seconds on the down, hold for one second or pause for one second, four seconds on the up. So the whole movement is controlled and slow. And I really like that. 
And these rep in the rep ranges and weights and sets will will affect that. I'll get to that in a second. And the third one is what I call super slow. Eight seconds down, eight seconds to go all the way down. So you bring a bench press all the way down, hold for two seconds, push it out for two seconds. So I work in three speeds of motion. And from that speed of motion, I set sets and reps. Now, sets and reps, everyone wants to know how much weight, how many sets, how many reps. Well, the the exercises themselves, uh, or the speed of the motion and the exercise will dictate it. But I work between 10 reps or 8 reps and 30 reps, depending on what speed of motion I do. The most important thing is not the reps and not the, not the weight, um, but, but it's, it's the fatigue factor, right? To get a strength response, right, to make the muscle adapt, to build, break down, build up, get stronger, we have to take the muscle to fatigue. Now, whether that's six reps with a really heavy weight or 30 reps with a light weight, uh, the effect is the same. We take the muscle, we do as many reps where it's quite fatiguing, quite difficult to do another rep with great form, and that's that. We know that we've taken that muscle to fatigue and the body gets a response. So I work across all the board. I like to work on what's called a complex training program. Monday, I might do um, a normal weight, right? So the normal pace where I'm doing four seconds down, one second hold, two second up, and I might do 30 reps, okay? And that just, you know, that because the weight is about a medium to light weight. Another day, I might do eight to 10 reps of four down, one pause and four up, but with quite a, you know, a heavy to medium weight, that means I can't do any more. In other days, I might do eight seconds down, you know, two, two second pause, two second up, and I'll do that with you know, quite, a, quite a medium to heavy weight again, but the time under tension, that's what we're really manipulating. Time under tension means how much time we're really holding the weight, right, will mean that I can only do the same weight as I could have, you know, if I was doing 15 or 20 of them fast. I don't want to confuse you too much there, but what I want to really emphasize is that I like to keep it mixed, right? I like to keep shocking the body so it keeps eliciting, uh, so it keeps uh, making sure it has to adapt and respond. But nice and slow, nice and controlled, and just let your muscles tell you how many reps you've done, okay? Mm. So you listen body so that's the basic framework of how i how i do the strength training itself right and then we get on to the exercises you use <laughs> yeah so um some of the ones that you mentioned may uh, you know may not be available to folks at the moment with the gyms although i know that australian gyms are about to open um you know in a few weeks we're recording this uh early june 2020 um but I, I like, I love the principles and I, I, I love the concept that, you know, it doesn't matter as much how many reps, it's just this time under pressure concept. And the extreme version of this is when I've done Bikram yoga over the years, as you know, um, and uh, when I was, you know, getting into it really, you know, um, really passionately and doing it all the time. You know, I was noticing my leg strength getting more and more and literally just holding isometric postures, like not even doing reps, but just like holding one posture for a long period. So it just goes to show that it, the extreme also can apply um, if the body is just held at that time under, under load uh, with just a single rep for a long time too, right? That's right. I mean, isometric training is something that can be very valuable for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's not my go-to, but it's mm. there. It's what I consider have sort of different levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced of what really suits them, what type of actual exercise or strength training modalities suit them. So when it comes to a beginner, the what I call contract and hold, right? Yeah. Contract and hold. Simply, if you had a bicep and you just squeeze your bicep, right, up, and contract it and hold it, right, up, and then release it. That has significant advantages for you because you're actually just forcibly contracting the muscle group, right? But it means we've got, we don't need any weight. We don't need – we can do it anywhere, anytime, and it has advantages for you. And the one that's very closely to that is isometric training. 
Isometric training is essentially pushing against a force that doesn't move. Put mm-hmm. your hands together and push together right, with yep. for five seconds. Right? There's muscles that are working right, quite hard to hold that contraction at maximal tension. And so they're very beneficial and they can be really good for beginner level people. And then with the, I also really like to use um, resistance bands. You know, resistance bands are really a good, safe, and easy entry into strength training because they're quite loose in the, in the first range of motion. And they only get hard right at the end of the range of motion. And so we're wanting to do the techniques properly, and we're also wanting to squeeze that muscle we're trying to work at the end of range of motion. So it kind of combines a little bit of the isometric training at the end. Um, and then there's some modified body weight that I also like to do in the beginning. The modified body weight just means that we're going to use um, things to help us. Like some, for many people, a squat is quite a difficult motion, right? Just sitting down onto a chair and getting up. So we sit down onto a chair or a, or a armchair that has n- nice handles, nice big arms on it, and we can sort of just help ourselves out of it and lower ourselves into it. And there are many different uh, exercises that I use depending what you've got available. We can use you know, we can use milk cartons with handles on it. We can use cans of beans. We can use water bottles. You can use shopping bags. Right? I've got a whole series of exercises that use um, one, a chair, and two, shopping bags. Right? Just because you know, we can lift them, pull them, push them, right? and do things that really do that make a difference. Right? You think about it. You can pick up your shopping. You squat down. You pick it up. Right? That's that's one of the biggest strength training moves in in the industry. That's called a deadlift. Right? That's that's as good as it gets. Right? But you're just doing it with your shopping. <laughs> um, that's beginner level. and intermediate level, we just move on a little bit and we start to introduce you know, possibly some machine weights, um, possibly some more advanced body weight and possibly, you know, obviously I like to work with dumbbells if anyone has got them, right? Dumbbells because they work even inside. We understand what a dumbbell is. They're small little weights you can hold in your hands, right? Um, and we just advance. They're the same exercise, same type of exercises are there, the same rep ranges, the same sets, the same weight, the same theory always applies. Just a matter of it's very dependent on where the client is, what level they're mm-hmm. at. As we, we talked about before we went on air, some people, you know, they may not be able to hold things in their hands. Mm-hmm. Do, you know, because when there's a flare up in your hand, you know how it is, right? It's extremely painful to try and hold anything. So we can put weights and, and things that go on their, their forearms, okay? We can use like isometric exercises which don't involve them holding anything. We can use um, resistance bands where they hook it around their forearms. It's really you know, really important to, I guess, just know the variables, know what's possible, right? And that's the hard part for the people out there in the public. Right? Mm. They, okay, if something's sore, I can't do anything. Where well, there's always a workaround. There's always a, there's always a way that I can get you to do something that's very beneficial, right? Once again, if you understand the minimal effective dose, you understand that, okay, I'm, you're telling me I can work for seven minutes today and that's going to be effective? And I'm like, Absolutely. You just do seven minutes, seven exercises in seven minutes, nice and slow, nice and controlled. Right? If that's all you do today, that's fantastic. Right? You're 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 winning. You're in front. Right? If you do something like that every day, the progressive consistency builds up. And obviously, of course, at the end of that range is obviously the advanced people, people that and there are many people that who are extremely fit before rheumatoid arthritis kicked in. They still want to train hard. They want to get back to doing the big stuff. So we can do all the free weight ranges, you know, that they can on any given day. Dumbbells, kettlebells, you know, barbells, you know, they're doing you know, some good solid strength training. Obviously, because they're getting the, you know, the bigger gains from, from that because the movements are more complex and a little bit more intense. But it is very much individual, this thing, right? more than maybe any other population group I work with because – if you're working with the elderly who are just you know, just a little bit weak, kind of the same every day. You know what they can do yesterday. You know what they can do today, right? Because it's just a progressive thing. Rheumatoid arthritis doesn't work like that because you might be great on Monday and on Tuesday, 
it's just we can't do the same type of things. We have to work around that. You've just got to go, okay, what can I do today that's going to make a difference that, that, that fits how I feel today? And that's, and that's really key. And we sometimes for me, you know, I might go, okay, we have a good strength day plan. We're going to do our 20 minutes of strength training. And it's like, listen, I'm just too sore, it's too inflamed. Right, we'll just either go to the water. Right? That's always a winner, right? The water's always a winner, right? And right? when it comes to when it's on those bad days, we might just do some range of motion exercises, some some mobility and some flexibility work that really opens up those joints, flushes those joints out, as I say. And so often, more often than not, it makes them feel a little better as well. You know, not only because they feel like they've still done something, right, but because the actual muscles and joints themselves get a little bit alleviated because they've been taken through, they've been mobilized, they haven't been just less still and stagnant. So yeah. it, it, is a, you know, it is something which there, there's a method to it. We've just got to um, ensure that you, you sort of know your options and, and work within your limits on any given day. Yeah, I loved all that. That was fascinating. And the way, the workarounds that you talked about, some I'd never even thought of, you know, putting stuff around the, the forearms and resistance bands and things. I mean, I have some resistance bands here and some of those cables that also offer, you know, resistance, like those tube resistance uh, uh, cables. Um, I've been using those and I've been using the elastic bands and I've been doing some makeshift um, deadlifts. You mentioned those. Um, but yeah, I think that it's really surprising how much we can get done even without a gym and without full complete abilities that we used to have. And whilst this isn't uh, pointing the finger and say, Hey, you need to lift your game. You know, it's not that it's saying that if you're motivated to do something, there's always a way to do something, right? Well, it's, it's, it's the old saying there that, that knowledge is not power, but knowledge followed by action is power, right? So you can know about it and that doesn't do anything. But if you know about it and then actually get motivated and go do it, that's when the real magic happens, right? So we've got to it's always, you know, Nike had it coined a long time ago, just do it, right? So <laughs> we've got to... Uh, you know, you, you do have to get out there, but you know, you, you've got to have the confidence to understand that, okay, this is not going to hurt me. This is going to benefit me, right? Mm-hmm. Especially in the long run, it might be a little bit uncomfortable right mm-hmm. now. And, you know, I might have to go past my comfort zone right now. But for some people, that, that's difficult. I don't want to go past my comfort zone because I'm in so much pain so often. Why would I want to hurt myself voluntarily, right? And you've got to, you've got to have faith that, by taking yourself past that comfort zone just a little bit and progressing it slowly, 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 that eventually you know, it comes back around full circle and everything gets better. You get fitter, you get stronger. You, as I said, you feel better about yourself. You can move better. You've got more balance. You've got more coordination. You can do more in the day. You don't get fatigued as much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and a little bit of faith to start with, but you've got to just sort of draw that line in the sand and go, right, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to see whether this bloke knows what he's talking about, right? whether you're working with a physical therapist or you're working with a physio or, or somebody you know, or a, a trainer just like myself who's, who's done a lot of work with these people, um, and with people who have these inflammation in their joints, and just you just got to do it you know, and understand that there's going to be bad days and there's going to be good days. Right? And you know, like life, it's a roller coaster. You know? mm. Enjoy the way down and then that. And then grind through the ways up and you get, get to the end of that roller coaster. So, you know, I, I work with this a lot. I understand the, the um, mentality. And whilst I don't, you know, have that, suffer from that joint pain, you know, I, I do fully understand what's going through your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good, mate. I know you also you're running short of time now. Um, I just checked the time and time's gone very quickly. Um, just to, to eliminate um, some uh, limiting beliefs here, is this going to be easier for for men than women, or do you feel that uh, women have uh, an equal opportunity to build some muscle as men? So can we dismiss that myth? Yeah, well, absolutely. Men and women equally. There is absolutely no disparity. I mean, obviously men are stronger by nature. You know, by nature, we're 50% stronger in the upper body, 30% stronger in the lower body due to the muscle fibers, due to things like testosterone, growth hormone, and things like that. But the responses are the same, right, for men and women. But right? it just 
It just means that, you know, obviously we're not comparing you know, apples with apples here, but for the individual themselves, right, they can eat, both get equal gains and equal improvements that are going to make a difference to their rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, and that's all that matters. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Women, um, and then I, I would say women should do it more than men for that reason, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, two last questions. What are, what are some good, what, just some simple strategies to get the mindset right to get started? What do you do if you don't feel like exercising one day or if a client doesn't in the mood? Is there anything that you can just change your state? Absolutely. I, I have something that I tell everybody, you know, when they don't feel like exercising, they don't feel like doing anything. And that's, and, and that's you know, what I tell everybody is, you know, when it comes to with a cardio session, put your joggers on and walk out the door. If you get to the front gate right, and you want to turn around, turn around and go back inside. Right? You'll find that human nature, being what it is, thinks, well, I've got my shoes and I've got my gear and I'm out the door. I might as well keep on going. <laughs> Same with doing weight training. So, you know what? I don't want to do anything today. And this is where the minimal effective dose really works well. You know, I might give you two or three little jigsaw workouts and they might have five workouts in one and there might be five body weight exercises in one. There might be five hand exercises in another. There might be you know, three core exercises in another. I don't feel like doing the body weight. I don't feel like doing the core. I'll do my hand exercises. You know, I'll get my like this, get my elastic thing with this, and I'll spread my. I'll do that. Then I'll get my squishy ball and I'll squeeze that. And then I'll do my circles and flexes up and down. And then what happens is you just do the easy thing. Just start with the easy thing. Is what I'm saying. Do the thing that doesn't mentally daunt you. And what happens, as I say, is you start one. You're like, oh well, I've started now. Maybe I will do that core exercise, those three core. Well, I've done those. Maybe I will do those six strength exercises. What I say is take the pressure off yourself. Do the easy things. Do one thing. Do one thing. Right? When you don't feel like it, just do one easy thing and then reassess after you've done that one thing. Make no, okay? there's uh, no buy in here. If you do the one exercise and you really go, no, nah, I'm not doing it today, so be it. But at least you've tried. You'll find that you will actually. You know, continue on because human nature is built that way. Yeah, absolutely. It's hilarious. You know, I'm sure everyone can feel like you're describing them. Uh, I certainly feel that way as well. Mate, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, you've gotten up super early to do this for us. Um, how can people con- how can people <laughs> how can how can people contact you if they would like to uh, get some input on their situation and some some personalized um, training programs from you? Uh, yeah, I guess the best case would be to go through my email. Just email me by all means. Um, my email is info, I N F O at life fit as the way it sounds. Life is in living and fit is in fitness, but info at life dot au for Australia. Okay. Perfect, mate. Well, Thanks again. This has been fantastic. Great to see you as well. It's been a while since we've seen each other face to face and uh, all the stuff that you're doing is fantastic. And that information was brilliant. So thanks very much for coming on this episode. Thanks, Glenn. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck to all those people out there. Remember, you can do it too. It's very important and you'll reap the benefits. Just, uh, just start with one thing. Mm-hmm.